Chapter 9. Powder and Arms. The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and round the stern of many other ships, and the cables sometimes grated underneath our keel, and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we got alongside, and we were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man, who seemed angry with everything on board, and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly gotten down to the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, asking to speak with you, said he. I'm always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind the messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all ship shape and seaworthy. Well, sir, said the captain, better speak plain, I believe, even at the risk of offense. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my first officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps you don't like the ship, inquired the squire very angrily, as I could see. I can't speak to that, as I've not seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft, more I can't say. Oh, possibly, sir, you do not like your employer either, says the squire. But here, Dr. Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he. Stay a bit. No use of questions such as that, but to produce ill feeling. The captain has either said too much, or he said too little. And I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise? Now tell me why. I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders to sail the ship for that gentleman where he should bid me, said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey. I don't. Next, said the captain. I learn we're going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on account, and I don't like them above all when they're secret, and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret's been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot? Asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief that neither of you gentlemen know what you're about, but I'll tell you the way of it. Life or death and a close run. That is all clear, and I dare say, true enough replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next you say, you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett. And I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands, if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should have perhaps taken you along with him. But the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried Squire. No, sir, replied the captain. Only that he's too familiar. Well, now, and the short and the long of it, Captain, asked the doctor. Tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then as you've heard me very patiently saying things that I could not prove, hear me a few more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there, first point? Then you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berth here, beside the cabin? Second point. <sighs> Any more? Asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard, continued Captain Smollett. That you have a map of an island. 
that there are X's on the map to show where the treasure is, and that the island lies. And then he named the latitude and longitude exactly. Oh, I never told that, cried the squire to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Livesey, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't matter who it was, replied the doctor, and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was a loose talker. Yet, in this case, I believe he was really right, and that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point that it be kept a secret from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask that you allow me to resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark, and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people, and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offense, I deny your right to put words in my mouth. No, Captain Sir, would be justified in going to sea at all, if you had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him to be thoroughly honest. And some of the men are the same. All may be, for what I know. But I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man Jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right. And I ask you to take certain precautions or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile. Did you ever hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, but I dare say you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stake my wig that you meant more than this. <laughs> Doctor, said the captain, you are smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had lives you not be here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have hurt you. I will do as you desire but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that, he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor. Contrary to all of my notions, I believe you managed to get two honest men on board with you. That man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as to that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had already begun to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing, at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern, out of what had been the after part of the main hold. And this set of cabins was joined to the galley and forecastle by a spare passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, and the doctor and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Redruth and I were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been lodged on each side till you might have called it a round house. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew. But that is only a guess, for as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder in the berths, and the last man or two, and Long John, along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing, so ho, mates, says he. What's this? We're a changing of the powder, Jack, answers one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John. If we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. You may go below, my man. Hans will want supper. Aye, aye, sir, answered the cook, and touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of the galley. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, 
Be polite, Captain Smollett. Easy with that, men. Easy. He ran on to the fellows, who were shitting the powder, and then suddenly observing me, examining the swivel, we carried amidships, a long brass nine. Here you, ship's boy. He cried. Out of that. Off to the cook to get some work. And then as I was hurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, Well, I have no favorites on my ship. I assure you, I was quite of the squire's way of thinking and hated the captain deeply. End of chapter 9.